To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, Chapter 8. For reasons unfathomable to the most experienced prophets in Macomb County, autumn turned to winter that year. We had two weeks of the coldest weather since 1885, Atticus said. Mr. Avery said it was written on the Rosetta Stone that when children disobeyed their parents, smoked cigarettes, and made war on each other, the seasons would change. Jem and I were burdened with the guilt of contributing to the aberrations of nature, thereby causing unhappiness to our neighbors and discomfort to ourselves. Old Mrs. Radley died that winter, but her death caused hardly a ripple. The neighborhood seldom saw her except when she watered her can. And Jem and I decided that Boo had got her at last, but when Atticus returned from the Radley house, he said she died of natural causes. To our disappointment. <sighs> Ask him, Jim whispered. You ask him. You're the oldest. That's why you want to ask him. Atticus, I said, did you see Mr. Arthur? Atticus looked sternly around his newspaper at me. I did not. Jem restrained me from further questions. He said Atticus would still touch us about us and the Radleys and it wouldn't do to push him any. Jim had a notion that Atticus thought our activities that night last summer were not solely confined to strip poker. Jem had no firm basis for his ideas. He said it was merely a twitch. Next morning I woke, I looked out the window and nearly died of fright. My screens brought Atticus from his bathroom half-shaven. The world's end in Atticus! Please do something! I dragged him to the window and pointed. No, it's not, he said. It's snowing. Jem asked Atticus would it keep up. Jem had never seen snow either, but he knew what it was. Atticus said he didn't know any more about snow than Jem did. I think, though, if it's watery like that, it'll turn to rain. The telephone rang and Atticus left the breakfast table to answer it. That was Eula May, he said when he returned. I quote, as it has not snowed in Macomb County since 1885, there will be no school today. Eula May was Macomb's leading telephone operator. She was entrusted with issuing public announcements, wedding invitations, setting off the fire siren, and giving first aid instruction when Dr. Reynolds was away. When Atticus finally called us to order and bade us look at our plates instead of out, out the windows, Jem asked, How do you make snow, ma'am? I have the slightest idea, said Atticus. I don't want you all to be disappointed, but I doubt if there will be enough snow for a snowball even. Calpurnia came in and said she thought it was sticking. When we ran to the backyard, it was covered with a feeble layer of soggy snow. We shouldn't walk about in it, said Jem. Look, every step you take's wasting it. I looked back at my mushy footprints. Jem said if we waited until it snowed some more, we could scrape it all up for a snowman. I stuck out my tongue and caught a fat flake. It burned. Jem, it's hot. No, it ain't. It's so cold it burns. Now don't eat it, Scout. You're wasting it. Let it come down. But I want to walk in it. I know what. We can go walk over at Miss Maudie's. Jem hopped across the front yard. I followed in his tracks. When we were on the sidewalk in front of Miss Maudie's, Mr. Avery accosted us. He had a pink face and a big stomach below his belt. See what you've done, he said. It hasn't snowed in Maycomb since Appomattox. It's bad children like you make seasons change. I wondered if Mr. Avery knew how hopefully we had watched last summer for him to repeat his performance, and reflected that if this was our reward, there was something to save for sin. I did not wonder where Mr. Avery gathered his meteorological statistics. They came straight from the Rosetta Stone. Jim Finch! You Jim Finch? Mrs. Maudie's calling you, Jim. You all stay in the middle of the yard. There's some thrift buried under the snow near the porch. Don't step on it. Yes, am called Jem. It's beautiful, ain't it, Miss Maudie? Beautiful, my hind foot. If it freezes tonight, it'll carry off all my azaleas. Miss Maudie's old sun hat glistened with snow crystals. She was bending over some small bushes, wrapping them in burlap bags. Jem asked her what she was doing that for. Keep him warm, she said. How can flowers keep warm? They don't circulate. I cannot answer that question, Jim Finch. All I know is if it freezes tonight, these plants will freeze, so you cover them up. Is that clear? Yes, I'm Miss Maudie. What, sir? Could Scout and me borrow some of your snow? 
Hammond's alive. Take it all. There's an old peach basket under the house. Haul it off in that. Miss Monty's eyes narrowed. Jim Finch, what are you going to do with my snow? You'll see, said Jim, and we transferred as much snow as we could from Miss Monty's yard to ours, a slushy operation. What are we going to do, Jim? I asked. You'll see, he said. Now get the basket and haul the snow you can rake up from the backyard to the front. Walk back in your tracks, though, he cautioned. Are we going to have a snow baby, Jim? No, a real snowman. Got to work hard, now. Jim ran to the backyard, produced the garden hoe, and began digging quickly behind the wood pile, placing any worms he found to one side. He went in the house, returned with the laundry hamper, filled it with earth, and carried it to the front yard. When we had five baskets of earth and two baskets of snow, Jim said we were ready to begin. Don't you think this is kind of a mess? I asked. Looks messy now, but it won't later, he said. Jim scooped up an armful of dirt, patted it into a mound on which he added another load, and another until he had constructed a torso. Jim, I ain't ever heard of a nigger snowman, I said. He won't be black long, he grunted. Jim procured some peach tree switches from the backyard, plated them, and bent them into bones to be covered with dirt. He looks like Stephanie Crawford with her hands on her hips. I said, fat in the middle and a little bitty arms. I'll make him bigger. Jim sloshed water over the mud man and added more dirt. He looked thoughtfully at it for a moment. Then he molded a big stomach below the figure's waistline. Jim glanced at me, his eyes twinkling. Mr. Avery's sort of shaped like a snowman, ain't he? Jim scooped up some snow and began plastering it on. He permitted me to cover only the back, saving the public parts for himself. Gradually, Mr. Avery turned white. Using bits of wood for eyes, nose, mouth, and buttons, Jem succeeded in making Mr. Avery look cross. A stick of stove wood completed the picture. Jem stepped back and viewed his creation. It's lovely, Jem, I said. Looks almost like he'd talk to you. It is, ain't it? He said shyly. We could not wait for Atticus to come home for dinner, but called and said we had a big surprise for him. He seemed surprised when he saw most of the backyard and the front yard, but he said we had done a Jim Dandy job. I didn't know how you were going to do it, he said to Jim. But from now on, I'll never worry about what'll become of you, son. You'll always have an idea. Jim's ears reddened from Atticus's compliment, but he looked up sharply when he saw Atticus stepping back. Atticus squinted at the snowman a while. He grinned, then laughed. Son... I can't tell what you're going to be, an engineer, a lawyer, or a portrait painter. You perpetrated a near libel here in the front yard. We've got to disguise this fellow. Atticus suggested that Jem hone down his creation's front a little, swap a broom for the stove wood, and put an apron on him. Jem explained that if he did, the snowman would become muddy and cease to be a snowman. I don't care what you do so as long as you do something said Atticus. You can't go around making caricatures of the neighbors. Ain't a caricature, said Jem. It looks just like him. Mr. Avery might not think so. I know what, said Jem. He raced across the street, disappeared into Miss Maudie's backyard, and returned triumphant. He stuck her sun hat on the snowman's head and jammed her hedge clippers into the crook of his arm. Atticus said that would be fun. Miss Maudie opened her front door and came out of the porch. She looked across the street at us. Suddenly, she grinned. Jim Finch, she called. You devil, bring me back my hat, sir. Jim looked up at Atticus, who shook his head. She's just fussing, he said. She's really impressed with your uh, accomplishments. Atticus strolled over to Miss Maudie's sidewalk, where they engaged in an arm-waving conversation. The only phrase of which I caught was, erected an absolute morphodite in that yard. Atticus, you'll never raise him. The snow stopped in the afternoon. The temperature dropped, and by nightfall, Mr. Avery's direst predictions came true. Calpurnia kept every fireplace in the house blazing, but we were cold. When Atticus came home that evening, he said we were in for it, and asked Calpurnia if she wanted to stay with us for the night. Calpurnia glanced up at the high ceilings and long windows and said she thought she'd be warmer at her house. Atticus drove her home in the car. Before I went to sleep, Atticus put more coal on the fire in my room. He said the thermometer registered 16, 
that it was the coldest night in his memory, and that our snowman outside was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed, I was awakened by someone shaking me. Atticus's overcoat was spread across me. Is it morning already? Baby, get up. Atticus was holding out my bathroom and coat. Put your robe on first, he said. Jen was standing beside Atticus, groggy and tousled. He was holding his overcoat closed at the neck. His other hand was jammed into his pocket. He looked strangely overweight. Hurry, hun, said Atticus. Here's your shoes and socks. Stupidly, I put them on. Is it morning? No, it's a little after one. Hurry now. That something was wrong finally got through to me. What's the matter? By then, he did not have to tell me. Just as the birds know where to go when it rains, I knew when there was trouble in our street. Soft to feta like sounds and muffled scurrying sounds filled me with helpless dread. Whose is it? Miss Monty's, hon, said Atticus gently. At the front door, we saw fire spewing from Miss Monty's dining room windows. As if to confirm what we saw, the town fire siren wailed up the scale to a tremble pitch and remained there screaming. It's gone, ain't it? moaned Jem. I expect so, said Atticus. Now listen, both of you. Go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Keep out of the way. Do you hear? See which way the wind's blowing. Oh, said Jem. Atticus reckon we out start moving the furniture out? Not yet, son. Do as I tell you. Run now. Take care of Scout, you hear? Don't learn how to your sight. With a push, Atticus started us toward the Radley front gate. We stood watching the street fill with men and cars while fire silently devoured Miss Maudie's house. Why don't they hurry? Why don't they hurry? muttered Jem. We saw why. The old fire truck, killed by the cold, was being pushed from town by a crowd of men. When the men attached its hose to a hydrant, the hose burst and water shot up, tickling down on the pavement. Oh, Lord, Jem. Jem put his arm around me. Hush, Scout, he said. It ain't time to worry yet. I'll let you know when. The men of Maycomb in all degrees of dress and undress took furniture from Miss Maudie's house to a yard across the street. I saw Atticus carrying Miss Maudie's heavy oak rocking chair and thought it sensible of him to save what she valued most. Sometimes we heard shouts. Then Mr. Avery's face appeared in an upstairs window. He pushed a mattress out the window into the street and threw down furniture until men shouted, Come down from there, Dick! The stairs are going! Get out of there, Mr. Avery! Mr. Avery began climbing through the window. Scout, he's stuck, breathed Jem. Oh, God. Mr. Avery was wedged tightly. I buried my head under Jem's arms and didn't look again until Jem cried, He's got loose, Scout. He's all right. I looked up to see Mr. Avery cross the upstairs porch. He swung his legs over the railing and was sliding down a pillar when he slipped. He fell, yelled, and hit Miss Maudie's shrubbery. Suddenly, I noticed that the men were backing away from Miss Maudie's house, moving down the street toward us. They were no longer carrying furniture. The fire was well into the second floor and had eaten its way to the roof. Window frames were black against a vivid orange center. Jam, it looks like a pumpkin. Scout, look. Smoke was rolling off our house and Miss Rachel's house like a fog off a riverbank, and men were pulling hoses toward them. Behind us, the fire truck from Abbotsville screamed around the curve and stopped in front of our house. That book, I said. What, said Jim. That Tom Swift book, it ain't mine. It's Dill's. Don't worry, Scout. It ain't time to worry yet, said Jem. He pointed. Look at yonder. In a group of neighbors, Atticus was standing with his hands in his overcoat pockets. He might have been watching a football game. Miss Maudie was beside him. See? There. He's not worried yet, said Jem. Why ain't he on top of one of those houses? He's too old. He'd break his neck. You think we ought to make him get our stuff out? Let's don't pester him. He'll know when it's time, said Jim. The Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our house. A man on the roof pointed to places that needed it most. I watched our absolute morphodite go black and crumble. Miss Maudie's sun hat settled on top of the heap. I could not see her hedge clippers. In the heap between our house, Miss Rachel's, and Miss Maudie's, the men had long ago shed coats and bathrooms. They worked in pajama tops and nightshirts stuffed into their pants, but I became aware that I was slowly freezing where I stood. Jem tried to keep me warm, but his arm was not enough. 
I pulled free of it and clutched my shoulders. By dancing a little, I could feel my feet. Another fire truck appeared and stopped in front of Miss Stephanie Crawford's. There was no hydrant for another hose, and the men tried to soak her house with hand extinguishers. Miss Monty's tin roof quelled the flames. Roaring, the house collapsed. Fire gushed everywhere, followed by a flurry of blankets from men on top of the adjacent houses, beating out sparks and burning chunks of wood. It was dawn before the men began to leave. First one by one, then in groups. They pushed the Maycomb fire truck back to town. The Abbotsville truck had departed. The third one remained. We found out next day it had come from Clark's Ferry, 60 miles away. Jem and I slid across the street. Miss Monty was staring at the smoke and black hole in her yard, and Attica shook his head to tell us she did not want to talk. He led us home, holding onto our shoulders to cross the icy street. He said Miss Monty would stay with Miss Stephanie for the time being. Anybody want some hot chocolate? he asked. I shuddered when Atticus started to fire in the kitchen stove. As we drank our cocoa, I noticed Atticus looking at me, first with curiosity, then with sternness. I thought I told you and Jim to stay put, he said. Well, we did. We stayed. Then whose blanket is that? Blanket? Yes, ma'am, blanket. It isn't ours. I looked down and found myself clutching a brown woolen blanket I was wearing around my shoulders, squaw fashion. Atticus? I, I don't know, sir. I I turned to Jem for an answer, but Jem was even more bewildered than I. He said he didn't know how it got there. We did exactly as Atticus had told us. We stood down by the Radley gate, away from everybody. We didn't move an inch. Jem stopped. Mr. Nathan was at the fire, he babbled. I saw him. I saw him. He was tugging that mattress. Atticus, I swear. That's all right, son. Atticus grinned slowly. Looks like all of Macon was out tonight. In one way or another. Jem, there's some wrapping paper in the pantry. I think. Go get it and we'll... Atticus, no, sir. Jem seemed to have lost his mind. He began pouring out our secrets right and left in total disregard for my safety if not for his own. Omitting nothing. Not whole pants and all. Mr. Nathan put cement in that tree, Atticus, and he did it to stop us finding things. He's crazy. I reckon like they say, but Atticus, I swear to God, he ain't ever harmed us. He ain't ever hurt us. He could have cut my throat from ear to ear that night, but he tried to mend my pants instead. He, he ain't ever hurt us, Atticus. Atticus said, whoa, son, so gently that I was greatly heartened. It was obvious that he had not followed a word Jem said, for all Atticus said was, you're right, we'd better keep this and the blanket to ourselves. Someday, maybe, Scout can thank him for covering her up. Thank who? I asked. Boo Radley, you were so busy looking at the fire you didn't know when he put his blanket around you. My stomach turned to water and I nearly threw up when Jim held out the blanket and crept toward me. He sneaked out of the house, turned round, sneaked up, and went like this. Atticus said dryly, Do not let this inspire you to further glory, Jeremy. Jem scowled. I ain't going to do anything to him, but I'll watch a spark of fresh adventure leave his eyes. Just think, Scout, he said, if you just turn around, you'd have seen him. Calpurnia woke us at noon. Atticus had said we need not go to school that day. We'd learn nothing after no sleep. Calpurnia said for us to try and clean up the front yard. Miss Molly's sun hat was suspended in a thin layer of ice, like a fly in amber, and we had to dig under the dirt for her hedge clippers. We found her in her backyard, gazing at her frozen chart as Islas. We're well, bringing back your things, Miss Molly, said Jem. We're awful sorry. Miss Molly looked round, and the shadow of her old grin crossed her face. I always wanted a small house, Jim Finch. Gives me more yard. Just think, I'll have more room for my azaleas now. You ain't grieving, Miss Molly? I asked, surprised. Atticus said her house was nearly all she had. Grieving, child? Why, I hate that old cow barn. That would set fire to a hundred times myself, except they'd lock me up. But... Don't you worry about me, Jean Louise Finch. There are ways of doing things you don't know about. Why, I'll build me a little house and take me a couple of rumors and gracious, I'll have the finest yard in Alabama. Those belling grass will look plain puny when I get started. Jem and I looked at each other. How to catch, Miss Maudie? he asked. I don't know, Jim. Probably the flu in the kitchen. I kept a fire in there last night for my potted plants. Here you had some unexpected company last night, Miss Jean Louise. How'd you know? Atticus told me on his way to town this morning. 
To tell you the truth, I'd like to have been with you, and I've had sense enough to turn around too. Miss Maudie puzzled me. With most of her possessions gone and her beloved yard of shambles, she still took a lively and cordial interest in gems and mine affairs. She must have seen my perplexity. She said only thing I worried about last night was all the danger and commotion it caused. This whole neighborhood could have gone up. Mr. Avery will be in bed for a week. He's right so up. He's too old to do things like that, and I told him so. As soon as I can get my hands clean on when Stephanie Crawford's not looking, I'll make him a lane cake. That Stephanie's been after my recipe for 30 years, and if she thinks I'll give it to her just because I'm staying with her, she's got another thing coming. I reflected that if Miss Maudie broke down and gave it to her, Miss Stephanie could have followed it anyway. Miss Maudie had once let me see it. Among other things, the recipe called for one large cup of sugar. It was still a day. The air was so cold and clear we heard the courthouse clock clank, rattle, and strain before it struck the hour. Miss Maudie's nose was a color I had never seen before, and I inquired about it. I've been out here since six o'clock, she said. Should be frozen by now. She held up her hands. A network of tiny lines crisscrossed her palms, brown with dirt and dried blood. You've ruined him, said Jem. Why don't you get a colored man? There was no note of sacrifice in his voice when he added, Or scout me, we can help you. Miss Maudie said, Thank you, sir, but you've got a job of your own over there. She pointed to our yard. You mean the morphodite? I asked. Shoot, we can rake him up in a jiffy. Miss Monty stared down at me, her lips moving silently. Suddenly she put her hands to her head and whooped. When we left her, she was still chuckling. Jem said he didn't know what was the matter with her. That was just Miss Maudie.